Um, before we get really to the meat, John, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a journalist, you've written books, you write for the Scientific American, right? Yeah, so I've been, uh, I've been a science writer for exactly 30 years now. I went to, I was a, a, uh, an English major as an undergraduate, but I've always loved science. I wanted, I was uh, split when I was a young person between whether I should be a, a writer or a scientist, and then I realized I could be a science writer. And it turned out to be the perfect career for me. Uh, what brought us together, I think, was uh, that you've met Thomas Kuhn, the philosophy, philosopher of science, personally. You, you've had the rare opportunity to speak to the man himself, right. who was famous for writing uh, that uh, revolutionary book. I have it with me, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. I have the third yeah. edition. Um, and you've written almost exactly a year ago, almost to the day, you've written an article for the Scientific American, which I also have here with me, in which you tell about your meeting with Kuhn, which had taken place years before, I think in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you've made in this article the best summary ever, the best one-liner summary ever of Thomas Kuhn's idea. You wrote that according to Kuhn, scientists can never truly understand the real world between quotes or even each other. That's it. <laughs> Thomas Kuhn was such a complicated and interesting person and um, I'm so arrogant that I think in some ways he didn't fully understand um, how radical his view of the world is and um, so to me he's really kind of a philosopher of language and of the limits of language for knowing reality. Language is also always a kind of barrier as well to really understanding uh, how things are. And uh, it's, it's this kind of filter and it's always filtering out something essential. The weird thing about Kuhn is that I felt as though he, you know, part of him realized that that's what he was doing, but another part of him was appalled by this great revelation that he had had and was backpedaling away from it and trying to figure out ways around it uh, so that some kind of concept of truth, whether scientific or other kinds of truth, could be uh, preserved. If you put it that way, it, it sounds like a more or less ordinary epistemic thing, not, not a mystical yeah. revelation. I grew up in the 60s and so um, I took psychedelics, LSD, other drugs, where you, um, you have these experiences, you see reality in a way that you realize language is totally inadequate to describe, all right? It's a kind of mystical experience. And that was the crux of uh, Kuhn's philosophy that we, were, we are always, that there is no purely neutral objective um, standpoint from which to see the universe you always have some mindset that is often defined by uh, by a particular kind of language from which you're viewing the universe and so from that he concluded that um, if you're looking at the history of science you can't say as you put it that um, that we're going from bad theories to better theories and even possibly to true theories of nature, um, you're just going, you're just changing. You're going from one paradigm to another, but there is no absolute objective viewpoint from which you can say the newer paradigm is true and the old paradigm is false. A really very profound, radical view of, uh, of science and its relationship to nature, and one that I think is accurate in describing certain kinds of science, but completely false in describing other parts of science. He suspected that you needed a paradigm in order to even perceive the world. In other words, that the, as, as he said, the data are not neutral. Uh, the data is already laden with the assumptions, beliefs, and values of a paradigm. It doesn't acknowledge the degree to which um, the history of science in certain respects shows humans actually coming to grips with reality 
in really significant ways and discovering new facts about the world. So you're basically contradicting Kuhn's idea, which is that the notion of truth and falsity only exist within the context of a paradigm. You insist, I sense, on absolute truth, on the existence of truth outside of a paradigm, something that really is true in itself. It is really out there. Okay, what about um, the, the story that the Earth is round and not flat or cubical or whatever? I could argue that uh, when, when man thought that the Earth was flat, it was a time before automobiles, before planes, before ocean-going ships. And Earth being flat was a fairly good approximation of a small segment of a very large sphere. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't hold in, in our empirical space of today, because today we fly, today we go to the ocean, today we go to space. So we have a new convenient theory. But there was a time, less than a hundred years ago, where we thought that this spheroid was in absolute space-time. Mm -hmm. Today we know it isn't, so there is already another convenient fiction. <laughs> you sound just like my friend. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't negate the fact that we have, I believe that the Big Bang uh, has, big modern Big Bang theory has captured something really important about the origin and history of the universe in the same way that Darwin gave us an insight into the origin and the history of uh, life on Earth. I think that those are in some ways that they're stories, but they happen to be true stories. Kuhn was horrified at, um, at a lot of the consequences uh, or a lot of the um, conclusions that people drew from, uh, from his own philosophy which is and what made him in some ways a, uh, a kind of tragic figure. Regarding Kuhn a, a, as a figure, um, in 1969 he wrote a postscriptum for the structure of scientific revolutions in which he, he tried to make clear that his view of the scientific discovery process as a human process and, and the inability for us to gather neutral data, the, the, the paradigm ladenness of data, he tried to clarify that that was not an ontological view, that he was not adopting necessarily an idealist view that reality is purely a mental phenomenon. He was taking an epistemic view, a la Kant, that uh, whatever reality is, all we can have access to is our subjective apprehension of it. Yeah. Do you think he really meant that from the beginning? that he was ontologically neutral from the beginning? Or do you think he was backpedaling? Because when you read the structure of scientific revolutions and he talks about the world itself changing when the paradigm changes, yeah. that is, has such a power, of, a power of idealism in it. The question to my mind um, is whether he was trying to express what he really thought or he was trying to do damage control because he realized that um, that uh, his philosophy of science was being used in ways that were discrediting science and he was horrified by that. Oh, you know, in answer to your question, I'm going to cite my friend Jim McClellan again. Um, he said that when he studied under Kuhn, that Kuhn was definitely a realist. He believed that, you know, the world was out there um, and it, the world is what it is. And this would be a kind of uh, Kantian notion. And his philosophy was just about um, the, the sort of the limits of our ability to really see that world uh, as it is. So, Which in uh, itself is an abstraction, right? Because uh, you, can't, you can't access that world. It's an article of belief that you say that it is there. If, if you adopt Kuhn's view fully, integrally, uh, yeah. it becomes an act of belief. It becomes paradigmatic in itself. Those are galaxies way far away. That was a discovery that just suddenly expanded the whole universe and gave us this um, a true picture of the structure of the universe uh, that is irrevocable. It's 
philosophy as at its most absurd to say that there will be some period in the future when we look back and we realize that that um, we really should have had air quotes around galaxies <laughs> all along that galaxies are just going to go away and uh, we'll see them in some entirely different way.